I guess this is our traditional slot to talk a bit about what's in the queue. <laughs> and it's not very well structured as usual as well. Basically, we have a few bullet points with some keywords, and we'll just keep talking a bit about them. Um, this is mostly stuff scheduled on schedule for 2.5, maybe 2.6. Um, but we are very early in the development cycle. We just released 2.4. So nothing here is kind of cast in stone at this point. Um, maybe one of the larger areas where change is coming up is the Bro cluster. Um, and there are a number of pieces going into things which are changing there. One is I've been talking about broker. Um, we are in the process of switching over internally for the cluster installation to using broker instead of the existing communication framework. As I've been talking about that, that involves switching to the new API, that involves to getting rid of the proxy, that involves um, integrating the data stores and um, things like that. And then polishing the broker API, we have seen it's not maybe the most polished yet at some, at some edges. Um, so we are going to work on that. But he said we need to step away from the speaker. Oh, okay. But no, I mean the, that speaker. Oh, that speaker. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I thought you said the, the human yeah, speaker. Yeah, sorry, that was confusing. <laughs> um, yes. So this, this has been a, an area that we, that's, we've really had a lot of concern about for a long time. I mean, Robin started on, the, I'll just call it the cluster shell in 2006 or something like that, which is now bro control. Maybe I should say this, that the cluster shell was really only intended for my personal use because I was... <laughs> So and then I deployed it in production. Yeah, <laughs> that's what always happens. <laughs> so I, I was really just lazy to, to kind of keep starting all these bro, process, pro, bro processes and all those nodes. So I kind of started writing a wrapper, which are some of the artifacts you still see of that today. And that is what actually what Justin was talking about. A lot of the cleanup is kind of stuff I just screwed up back then. <laughs> Yeah, so that was the thing. It sort of grew from Robin's weird personal, not weird, awesome personal project. <laughs> then I, 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 told, I the, the actual process was he was writing it, and then six months later I told him, I've been using it in production for the last six months, and then he goes, what? He, wasn't, he was a little, uh, I think, dismayed maybe to hear that it had been being used in production, but it was, it was the only way that I could effectively run Ver bro. Verse, actually, you started telling other people to use it too. Oh. <laughs> I thought it was like a real project. Um, <laughs> so anyway, this has been a, sort of a big area of concern because it's, it's just so incredibly hard to run this stuff otherwise. I mean, you may have seen out of other, some of the other <clears throat> network, network monitoring tool communities, you'll, though actually the recommendation will be literally a, um, a shell loop that starts up a bunch of processes and it sort of feels insufficient, especially if you have to scale across multiple systems. And so it, it has this sort of model. But over time, uh, uh, as it's been used and more people have used it, and there have been people have complained about things, and we've complained about things and thought more about it, we keep refining the model. And Justin probably talked about Bro Control D. I guess I don't want to repeat too much of what was, uh, what was said already. But we realized that, that we needed to kind of really dramatically change things again. I mean, there are these really fundamentally problematic things, and that Bro Control doesn't really fit into systems very well, for one thing. Um, it, it, uh, you, if you, like, actually, if you install bro into like slash slash or slash user or something, you actually end up with like a file that is etsy node.cfg. What on earth is that? Or you end up with etsy networks.cfg. None of this stuff makes any sense. And it doesn't even feel very comfortable that it's spread across multiple files. And so we started talking about, it, did Justin talk about? So, so Justin, Justin talked is. mostly about the, that we are going to split out. Um, so what currently, it's, you're just starting bro control from the command line. It's a, it's a process running as long as you're in, inside this shell, and then it terminates. So, so bro control is turning into bro control D in the, in the sense of a daemon running. And Justin showed the, the, the web interface, the HTTP interface to that, or you will have a command line client to interact with it. But it will be running constantly in the background, essentially. So mm -hmm. that was kind of okay. the level. So it, it's all, we're also making a change so that the configuration is going to be unified so that you're not going to have bro control.cfg and node.cfg and networks.cfg. You'll actually have bro control.cfg, and it's going to be JSON. Um, 
maybe not the best choice, but I don't think there's any other better choices either for something that is machine readable. So for instance, you could have um, some interface and actually maybe graphically create your, your bro control configuration. And that's actually going to unify um, all of the concepts that uh, no, bro control.cfg provides to you and node.cfg and networks.cfg, but all unified actually in one configuration file. And Robin was commenting to me yesterday that we're probably going to provide some way to actually upgrade instead of just telling you, have fun, fix it yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. Um, so anyway, we, we realized, though, that we couldn't do it all at once. And we have Matthias. We're not different Matthias. It's so confusing. Um, it's, it's actually, th this progress is actually happening already, moving everything to the JSON configuration um, and actually doing some of the work that's scheduled for 2.6. So in, in 2.5, what you'll actually likely see is not, from your perspective, probably not really truly massive changes. There'll probably be some mechanism for upgrading your current .cfg files into the new JSON one so that, you know, so there's not really much effort there. Um, and it'll it should change to bro control D at that point where it's running in the background. There's no cron job that needs to run every five minutes anymore to, to do things. Um, that'll all be managed. So in that, in that instance, you can suddenly start running bro control D in init, or you can run it in system D or how, whatever your, start, your system startup process is. Um, but it actually set 2.5, adding that in 2.5 sets the stage for something much cooler in 2.6 where suddenly a cluster might be hierarchical. And um, you can actually do the stuff that I think has been talked about already, where you can actually have a hierarchy of um, bro control instances. So you could actually say, well, yes, we run a global network. Our network span, spans the entire globe. And yet, that's OK. We can manage it from one location. And yet, each of these, as you sort of walk down the tree, if links are broken between those, each one is able to independently operate. And you could, you know, like let's say, you know, your central area, your central thingy goes down and is dead, and nothing can talk to the central. There's some sort of cross-domain analysis that might go might go away, but you could still maybe SSH into this one and run bro control, the bro control client, and still do all of the stuff within that subtree. So it, that was something someone had brought up a concern. Well, what if I have links that go down? And so we actually redesigned stuff a little bit to account for that. And um, it, I think it'll work out pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, but I do. I really like the idea of having like hundreds of um, monitoring nodes around the world and having one configuration file for it. There's something like really deeply appealing about that to <laughs> me. Um, not, but not only one configuration file, but the, the thing that's especially neat about this, the moment that all of you start managing these possibly, in some cases, massive deployments that span the globe, um, you are describing to our system what your architecture looks like. What that actually enables us to do is start making frameworks and start making um, abstractions on top of this that give us the ability to do deeper analysis, or I guess I should say give you the ability to do deeper analysis, or us to provide you scripts that do deeper analysis across your network. Like, can you imagine if you have 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 um, monitoring points around the world, but they're all described in one configuration, and you can detect scanners, someone that hits here and here and here and here and here all over the world, and you detect them. But they only sent like one packet. So if you sort of go with the, the normal model, which is, well, we're monitoring here, and we're monitoring here, and we're monitoring here. This one says, oh, I saw a packet. This one says, oh, I saw a packet. This one says, oh, I saw a packet. And you don't detect it, because they're all sort of separate. <clears throat> but the moment that it's all sort of unified configuration, it opens the door for us to start figuring out mechanisms to say, let's unify this detection. And we actually have things in place already that, <clears throat> that are amenable. To, uh, to this type of analysis. So I, th I think we'll be able to do it, even though it sounds a little insane. So one reason why we are phasing that in a bit, a bit slowly is that with 2.6, we are thinking to actually change the deployment model for bro control D then. Um, so right now, if you set up a cluster, essentially you just configure the manager, and the manager pushes out everything, including the bro binary or the standard scripts to the nodes. Um, we keep hearing from sysadmins that that is kind of an odd deployment model. So what, what they would really like to have is just a package they install on e each of these nodes. Um, and then they start up and they, they talk to the manager and, and, and get just the configuration from there. 
um, is just fits much better into the normal workflow. So we are switching actually to this model, um, which is a more disruptive change for existing setups, and that's why we are kind of phasing this in slowly. Anything else? I guess, I guess we can move on here. Um, so Johanna talked about um, the new net control framework yesterday, the open flow stuff. Um, I don't want to say much more about that, except that that is something which pretty certainly will be in 2.5. Um, we will be polishing the, the API there more. We um, are hoping to collect some, some experiences with use cases. We are interested in hearing about use cases for SDN interfacing, in, in SDN interface to Bro. Um, different sites have very different ideas, how to use that, um, how to leverage that, and um, we hope we can support as many of these use cases as possible. Um, we will be working on more backends for the net control framework. One thing which keeps coming up is an Arista interface. So I know a bunch of people have these Arista switches with um, pretty nice APIs. So we will quite certainly have um, a backend for the net control framework eventually um, for that as well. Um, yeah, so I think that is that is. Uh, wait, wait, can I can yeah. I talk about that one for a second? So what what I actually like about the the net control framework is it's kind of just a, an API in Bro. It does it like code wise. There's not much there really. I mean the 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 OpenFlow stuff has got a lot of code, but the net framework is pretty simplified, but it's well, well, it's complicated, but it's just to implement that API. I, I mean that's it's just because you're implementing an API. There's not like a lot of mechanics in it, maybe. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do, let, I'll tell a story that I had from a while ago. This was um, the, the genesis of where the, um, the, and I know some of you have heard this before, so you have to excuse me. The, um, the SQL injection detection that's in Bro, that came from an incident that happened a number of years ago when I was doing incident response at the Ohio State University. And there, were, there, was, there was a host in China that started extracting data from a database. It was one every request, it got a record out of the database. And it did a whole bunch of these, and then suddenly, poop, pop, it popped over to a different address and started doing the same thing. And this, this sort of like bothered me. Now, it bothered me initially that I didn't detect it. So I started working on the SQL injection detection stuff. It bothered me that I didn't know how to protect us from this either. And now that there's this mechanism in Bro where I can maybe say, block this host. And it's just a function in Bro that I can call as a developer. I don't care how you're blocking it. Because that's, you know, and you probably heard, Johanna, how, to, like, how it configures on the back end. So you say, oh, to block stuff, you talk to this system. And you know, now I can block flows, or now I can block um, IP addresses. What, what I, my, my dream, and this has been my dream for a long time, about seven years, I want to have a script that can say, this host is being attacked. So 3 in the morning, you know, not 24-hour instant response team. You know, everyone's asleep at 3 in the morning, maybe. Um, frequently, I wouldn't be, but maybe I wouldn't be very functional at that point. But uh, you know, 3 in the morning, this host starts attacking. And maybe it's extracting data from a database. That's terrible. It's like, how much are they going to get before you wake up and you're really functional in the morning? Well, I want to distribute a script. I want to include it in Bro and say, let's go into protection mode on this thing. So what happens, we have detected that this host is a victim of apparent SQL injection attacks. We say, oh, it's a local host. So what we do is we say, let's say that anyone that sends a request, now that we're, we've decided we're going to protect this host, they've extracted 100 records out of our database, we say, we want to protect this host. So someone sends a packet or a, a dozen HTTP request, and it gets dinged as a potential SQL injection attack, we block that external host and send an email or a page or something and say, uh, we're protecting this host. We're blocking anyone. So then the, the attackers say, oh, I can't connect to the thing. I need to get more data out because I know they've got thousands and thousands of records, and I've only gotten 100. They hop to a new address. They send one request. Oh, block that one. Hey, I'm still protecting this host. They hop to another one. They send one request block that one. So you end up, you're not doing this in the normal case. The normal case is you're just watching. You're looking to see if someone's a victim. The moment that someone starts to be a victim, you protect them. And you're not blocking your own infrastructure. And you're not always blocking external hosts. So you're sort of limiting the potential damage because it's only going to go into this mode. 
if someone appears to be getting attacked, uh, victim, victimized, and it only um, blocks external hosts. But what I like is with the net control framework, if you get it set up, I can write that script and people can run it and you can go from um, essentially nothing to the sort of really neat protection mode with almost no effort and it just should work. It, there, there's, it's not like I should have to go, we'll do this and do this and do this and do this. It's more of, well, of course, when you're setting up Bro, you can figure the net control framework. That's my expectation over the next few years, is that's going to be one of those, well, of course you do that. There's so much benefit to doing that. Of course you do that. And so from my perspective now, three years in the future, we distribute that script, and it already works in everyone's infrastructure. All you have to do is download it, load it, and then suddenly you've got this fairly magical thing that maybe vendors sell that are, you know, they're sell for huge amounts of money, and they're like, it protects things that are being victimized. But this especially neat part there, and the part that I'm absolutely waiting for, there's a, because in higher ed at least, these days, there, is a, uh, there are numbers that people, that universities have that say, um, one record being compromised or stolen costs us X dollars. Well, I know in that one incident that happened at OSU, I know how much data was stolen. I could have actually said, at that point, with, a, with reasonable certainty, assuming that the attackers didn't just stop of their own you know, free will, that, well, they got 100 records. They could have gotten 50,000. And suddenly, that in bro says, we paid nothing for it. We just ran it. And we have concrete evidence that shows we just saved $4 million. That's the day I'm waiting for. And I think the net control stuff is a huge part of that. And I'm waiting for one, one instance of that to come up, and then I'm waiting for two, and three, and five, and 10. I can't wait for the community to be like, yes, in aggregate, in terms of you know, what people have talked about publicly, we've saved $500 million. That's the day I'm waiting for. <laughs> it will be coming. <laughs> I know. That's, I've been waiting for it for years, and it's been a lot of baby steps to get there. Yeah, yeah. Um, OK. Actually, another. Backend for the net control framework will be packet bricks, I'm pretty sure. You want to talk about yeah, I'll packet talk bricks? Packet bricks. So packet bricks has been another thing. I said yesterday that I used to work with the Click Software Router. Um, the Click Software Router is great. It, it also had some problems. Um, I, I don't even think it's worth going into the, the problems because you'd sort of have to know more about Click to really understand it. But Click, what it, what it is, is it's a directed graph. So you're essentially configuring this directed graph of elements. And you say, oh, bring, a, bring packets in, pass them to this thingy that does something, and then it splits it out to three other thingies, and then they do stuff. Packet Bricks is really, really similar with a few tweaks. Uh, the, well, I should say, the name came from the idea of like Legos. You're sort of assembling your, your packet pipeline. It, Maybe the best way to think about it is on host packet middleware, right? The packets come into your host. You want to do something with them at high performance. You want to, um, every other packet, you want to send out that interface. It's, it's not a good example, but you know, this is something that's doable. Or you want, to load, you want to take packets in, and you want to load balance them out to five processes. Or you want to duplicate every packet. So uh, one processing pipeline you might create is actually bring packets in, duplicate them, and then load balance them out to 10 bro processes and two snort processes. And you can start doing other crazier stuff too, like put a filter in somewhere. And what a filter, I think it's called filter, right? Um, I think so too. OK. Yeah. You might put a filter in place. So bro can talk to this at runtime, or other tools can talk to it at runtime and say, you know, I actually want anything re relating to this host send it to this other Bitbucket interface that's like a local interface that you can actually maybe sniff with TCP dump to actually see like the stuff that Bro is wanting to Bitbucket and just throw out. Um, but I, you know, there, I don't think there's a whole lot to say there. It's really neat, and it should actually solve a lot of problems for a lot of people, because I don't think people complain about how hard people they don't complain. That's the thing. No one complains about how hard it is to do stuff flexibly with packets when they get onto the host. 
but they do subconsciously. They, they're not meaning to complain about it, but they just say, oh, I had so much trouble getting this thing set up, and it's hard to do, and, and all of this stuff. But they never realizing, realize, I feel like, that what they're actually complaining about is there's no tool that's sort of this packet middleware that is like, we're not sending it to Bro. Packet Bricks is not a Bro-specific tool in any way at all. You could use it with Snort. You, you, you could use it with nothing. You could bring a packet in and send it out another interface. There's so many things you can do with it. The reason that it works fast, um, the guy that's been writing it is an intern that we had last summer. And he's coming back in October. And he's going to continue working on it. It's not quite at the point that, that it's usable yet for, for many purposes. But it uses NetMap underneath, which actually is a BSD bypass mechanism for the kernel. So it, and it runs on free. It, it actually is built into FreeBSD. It's, it's written by a FreeBSD core developer. So it's built into FreeBSD. And it supports Linux. So you can actually download it, build the kernel module, install it. It also has support for a lot of different network cards. So it's not just Intel NICs. It's not just 10 gig Intel NICs. But uh, the guy working on it, um, Luigi Rizzo, has actually made added support recently for the Intel XL710 NICs, the, the 40 gig NICs that Intel's just recently came out with. Um, but it also supports the VertIO NIC that is used in Zen. And it supports a, a bunch of other interfaces. But it's nice. It, it skips the kernel. And it, it gives you a really efficient way of getting packets. The guy that has been writing it, he actually did uh, load balance testing. So he, what did he do? He brought the packets in, duplicated them into two load balancers out to about 10 different processes. And he did that at 10 gigabits per second on sort of not any sort of mind-blowing system. And um, he, he, he's, he's very good at low-level development and understanding pa um, memory architectures and stuff. So this is written by a very capable person, fortunately, much more than me. Um, so anyway, just think of packet bricks as the upcoming packet middleware. It has nothing to do with Bro. You can use it with a lot of other things. It's going to solve a lot of people's problems. Um, yeah, feel, feel free to. I don't want to go any more into that. I could talk about that for an hour, but um, we'll just move on. <laughs> I guess we need to speed up a little bit. Yes. Um, fortunately, Ashish told you all about the authentication framework already. So um, the goal is that we hope to indeed get that integrated, because it will be a, a very cool capability. Uh, one thing that is a bit different about, um, and, and I honestly don't know that this is right either. I still need to work with Ashish on it more. Well, one of the differences about the authentication framework that's implemented in um, a branch right now that we've been working on for an incredibly long time uh, is, is it has sort of a more flexible notion of nodes in terms of it supports things like uh, what's the, the port authentication protocol? 802.1x. Yes, 802.1x. It supports that. So it actually, an IP address is not always like the login came from IP address, whatever. It's the login came from um, endpoint. I think it's endpoint is the, the phrase that's used. And it could be an IP address or a MAC address or maybe no, uh, some, some other stuff. But, it's, it's really hard to implement this because it's hard to sort of encompass the notion of authentication. But when it's there, I, I think it'll be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And there's another new framework coming up. Oh, yeah. So this the configuration framework is actually, if you notice during the, when I did the Broala announcement, or man, I don't know if I, I think I mentioned it during that. Um, it's this notion of runtime reconfiguration. So there's a lot of things in Bro now that you do redef on a const. And, those are not always changeable at runtime, even though there's an older thing that I used to use, but I was told not to use it anymore because it's scary. And um, this, is, this is a new mechanism that allows you to do runtime configuration, and it provides sort of some framing around how, uh, maybe, maybe the right word to say is it provides some formalization around how configuration is done, because then we can move towards this model of runtime reconfiguration so you don't have to restart. Mm -hmm. And and that'll be coming out of Broala at some point. I I wrote it in a way that's fairly amenable to pushing it back directly, but I just need to make sure it's good, <laughs> good from an external perspective before we push it back. Mm -hmm. All right. Then our last point um, is well a bit of foreshadowing that's coming, but also a heads up that and, and a reminder that we have this new plugin framework now since 2.4, which enables um, everybody. Um, in particular external people to write their own core functionality for Bro and, and, and 
provide that to others in the form of a, of a shared library, which Bro can read in at runtime. Um, so the user of that doesn't need to recompile the Bro anymore. It makes it really easy to add new uh, file analyzers, protocol analyzers, log writers, input readers, packet sources. Uh, Built-in functions. Built-in functions. Yes, the, my one that I didn't make on there is Approxidate. There's oh, the Approxidate yes. module I need to get on yeah. there too. So the three I listed here are actually um, either already merged into our plugin repository or are in the queue for uh, being merged. They are all external contributions. So there's um, the PF Ring plugin actually from the Entop guys. Um, there's a Redis writer in the queue and there's um, a extended TCP analyzer in the queue, which is specifically for adding uh, TCP measurement kind of stuff. So a lot of like, how is your TCP performing? Um, that is coming out of um, work of a graduate student who intensive, intensively looked at, at this kind of stuff. Um, so we have this, this is the, the plugin repository on the Bro uh, Git repository page, um, which is also a submodule of the, of the main distribution. And, and there we really um, encourage external distribution. So for each plugin, there's a, like a main maintainer in there. So, so we have a point of contact. Um, but we are kind of really open to integrating stuff there. And in the future, I hope at some point we will have a better mechanism to distribute these, but at this point we just collect them there. Or of course you can put up your plugins just on your personal GitHub page as well and um, provide it that way. Um, yeah, I think that concludes the list of at least what we know at this point, I would say. Usually <laughs> new things come up all the time. Um, some things don't make it into the next release, um, are being replaced by other stuff. Um, so take someone, it with gets, a grain of someone salt. gets inspired and just randomly on a Sunday yeah. writes a huge amount of code. And there's, there's that, and it always depends a lot on people around, people's time available. Um, so maybe sometimes there's this student coming, uh, which has this, this perfect skill for something which is totally not on the roadmap, um, but suddenly it's there. Anything else? No, I think that's it. All right.